Hello everyone. It's so nice to be with you here again today. It's Joyce Davis and I'm president and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Harrisburg. And we're again bringing you another great decisions discussion in our series. And the topic today could not be higher. It is one that I think is on everybody's mind. Uh, and that is the US-China trade rivalry. And frankly, it's not so much the trade rivalry that is causing people, but what other rivalries there might be that might cause more than just a little anxiety. So, and I'm happy to say that um, with us to lead in our discussion is, is someone that I think many of our uh, associates know well, Dr. Sanjay Paul from Elizabethtown College. Dr. Paul is an economics professor and spends a lot of his time thinking about this issue of US-China trade uh, rivalry and also teaching it to uh, uh, his students at Elizabethtown College. But I will give you a fuller introduction for Dr. Sanjay Paul when we come back after watching our video, our Great Decisions video on the US-China trade rivalry. Michelle, can you start the video? The United States stands at this time at the pinnacle of world power. It is a solemn moment for the American democracy. For with primacy in power is also joined an awe-inspiring accountability to the future. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Great Decisions Masterclass. We reach the midway point today in this eight lecture series by turning our attention to the rivalry between the United States and China as it relates to trade. All rivalries, of course, are multidimensional, and they're impacted by much more than bilateral relations. As we look at the global system's evolution over the course of the last century or so, we see how the global structure, defined as the number of great powers at any time, impacts the way the international system evolves. From 1900 until well into the 1930s, the global system was populated with six, seven, or even eight great powers, depending on how we define the term. A multipolar era gave way after World War II to only two nation states at the top of the food chain, the United States and the Soviet Union. An era of bipolarity had arrived. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, the United States was the sole meaningful power in world politics for at least a decade afterwards. A unipolar moment, an American moment in world affairs. As we look at the international system today, we can identify at least three major powers that are considered to be among the most influential in the international system. The United States, the People's Republic of China, and the Russian Federation. A tripolar era is upon us. Two questions that we immediately ask. The first is whether China will surpass the United States in overall economic, possibly even military size. And a related question, though distinct, will it succeed us as the global hegemon, the dominant power in world affairs? There are three main considerations that we will undertake before considering American foreign policy as it relates to U.S.-China trade relations. We'll first look at the economic rise of China, then China's economic strategy, and finally consider the threats and opportunities that present to us. China's economic rise is remarkable and unheralded in world politics. Beginning in the early 1980s, China rose economically like no major power has ever done. An important point of departure is the transition from Mao Zedong, who passed in 1976, to the emergence of Deng Xiaoping in 1978. After Mao died and Deng Xiaoping rose to power, that was one of the great events, I think, of the 20th century. But what he did was, if you will, decommunize or decentralize much of the economy of China. 
Mao was an ideologue and a communist through and through. Deng was a pragmatist, someone who once said, it matters not the color of the cat as long as it catches a mouse, which is a Chinese way of saying ideology doesn't really matter. Whether we're a communist economic system or a free trader, as long as it works for China, we will adopt it. At the core of Deng's economic philosophy was the establishment of trade centers along the coastline. Seven were identified as special economic zones, or SEZs, where free trade would occur, clearly countering the old communist ideology. These seven economic centers became the engines for China's economic growth. Along with the modernization and economic expansion of the coastline came a massive movement of Chinese people from the center of the country towards those economic centers. Most all of the lines of immigration that you see here are in the direction of the economic free trade zones. This internal migration of the Chinese population towards the major cities has fundamentally altered Chinese society. In the era of Mao Zedong, the country was overwhelmingly rural, as indicated by the Green Line. You can see how quickly that has changed in an era of trading and mass manufacturing. Manufacturing output is sharply up. You can see that China surpassed the United States around 2009 in overall industrial and manufacturing output. The per capita income of the country has risen sharply, especially since the opening of the economy in the 1980s. By the numbers, China is tied with the United States as the world's largest economy by volume. It is the fastest growing large economy in the international system, a workforce of roughly 800 million people with a very low poverty rate and a relatively low unemployment rate. China today also sits on top of over $3 trillion in foreign reserves, collecting hard currencies from around the world as a result of its trade policy. Looking at a graph of the major sovereign wealth funds in the world, China has two of them, as indicated here. Collectively, they're roughly $1.6 trillion. This is money that China can invest abroad in real estate, in stocks and bonds, in all sorts of investment instruments and reap a tremendous reward as a result. We next consider the strategy adopted by China for this economic success. Over the years, there have been three truly great and impacting Chinese leaders since the Communist Revolution of the 1940s. Mao Zedong is the founder of modern China. He adopted a communist mindset the economy was fully closed to international trade. Deng changed all of that in the late 1970s, opening the economy with those specialized economic zones and focusing on mass manufacturing. The current leader of China is Xi Jinping. He is somewhere between the two on this spectrum of openness, not as closed as Mao Zedong and not as open as Deng Xiaoping. The global presence of China has grown over the course of this last generation or so. Again, it was not always the case. Mao Zedong wanted to stay on the periphery, away from the two superpowers, give his people time to develop and create a viable economy. Deng Xiaoping modernized but did so very quietly. Xi Jinping has done so very loudly. His goal is to make China a major force in world politics, and in doing so, he has greatly increased China's global presence by significantly engaging the world. Xi has embraced global power, and that is a clear departure from his major predecessor, Deng Xiaoping, who once said, hide our capabilities and bide our time, never try to take the lead. Compare that statement with Xi, when he said, be ready for war with the United States over Taiwan by 2027. One of the more ambitious efforts of China to claim control of its region is the so-called Nine Dashed Line, indicated here in red. This is China's claim 
to the South China Sea. And inside of that claim, you not only have other countries' legitimate claims, but a lot of natural energy and resources. China is rapidly building up its presence in the South China Sea by creating artificial islands and militarizing them. The trade strategy of China, well, is divided. For the global south, Asia, Africa, and Latin America, the Chinese are investing. Low interest loans for infrastructure development with a deal to extract important resources from zinc to aluminum, oil, and natural gas from those countries. We see here how the United States and Europe have trended downward in terms of investing abroad in infrastructure development by lending resources to them. China, on the other hand, has risen rather dramatically. It is becoming the number one investor in global infrastructure lending. This is most reflected in the new Silk Road, what China calls its Belt and Road Initiative. Areas in blue are investments in ports for naval vessels, and of course the black lines are across land, bridges, roads, and other critical infrastructure to give China access to markets far and abroad. One of the areas of great concern for the United States in the Western world is China's dominance of so-called rare earth metals. These are elements used in all sorts of modern conveniences like computers, cell phones, in industry, and broadly across the economy. You'll note that the United States used to be a rare earth producer in the 1990s, giving way to a full Chinese monopoly. By 2005, we have since reversed our path and begun to exploit rare earth metals for ourselves. We do not want to be wholly reliant on China for rare earth metals. We've looked at the way that China engages the South. How about the global North, the United States, and the Western economies? Here the strategy is different. They want to create a massive trade surplus in their favor to continually build up their national reserves and use economic espionage as a way of stealing the secrets of the West to very quickly move ahead of us in industrial and economic production. Or what they would do is they would send a small army of people to the United States to photocopy patents. Around 2006, the volume of the patents became so heavy there was no possible way that you could move that much paper. China moved to a cyber method of doing this. So what's going on right now is China has hacked into, according to the director of the FBI, every major company in the United States. China's corporate spy war is happening all around us. Initially, we thought the Chinese were simply trying to narrow the gap, adopting a strategy that would allow them to catch up to us in critical areas like energy production, aerospace, and the military. As a result of Chinese espionage, we've lost about $600 billion in only the last two decades. Increasingly, there is a consensus in the West that China is not simply trying to narrow the gap with corporate spying, but actually trying to eliminate American corporations. This is a dire threat to the United States. Think about TikTok. I made a reference to this in the previous lecture. 150 million Americans are using this social media app. It can track every keystroke, every website visited, collect sensitive personal data, and transmit it back to the Chinese government via the Chinese company that owns it. So what are the additional threats posed to us by China in this trade relationship? The one most commonly referenced is our trade imbalance with China. As you can see on this graph, beginning in 2001, increasingly China has outsold to us what we have been able to export to China. And that creates a trade imbalance on our side in the negative and a positive for the Chinese. This sort of graph has been the rallying call for decisive measures by the U.S. to protect our economy from Chinese exports. We argue they are unfairly manufactured, that the government is playing a heavy hand in the production of Chinese exports, and that our exports don't have the opportunity 
to sell fairly in China. All of that is true. However, we do need better data on the true relationship between the United States and China on issues such as surpluses and deficits because this data is stunningly misleading. I remember in the 1980s taking a course called International Political Economy as part of my political science major. And the professor began by saying the 1980s are truly different than all decades beforehand. And that is because of multinational corporations. Long gone are the days when countries produce something inside. Now commodities from automobiles to telephones are produced all over the world in various stages. By the time they get to the United States, they may have been through 12 or 15 countries in the manufacturing process. And he told us that the trade data we're using in the 1980s is misleading because it doesn't take into account the multinational nature of products that are produced abroad. China, as the last exporter of many of these internationally produced goods, is given full export credit for the price of that commodity. Let's look at one example, the iPhone. Everyone knows that the iPhone is manufactured in China. Well, it's put together there, it's packaged there, and it's exported to Europe and the United States. If we look at the total value of an iPhone represented in this pie chart, we can take away the cost of materials and look only at the profitable aspects of the product. Overwhelmingly, 75% of the profits of an iPhone stay in the United States. These are American companies that own these manufacturing instruments. And as a result, most of the profits are not found in China. In fact, only a very small fraction, about 2% of the profits, are attributed to China. And yet, because we credit China for the full value of an iPhone when it leaves its shore, this commodity alone adds $2 billion to our annual trade deficit. So the first thing we need to do is get better data, more reflective information about the true nature of a multinational supply chain. There are meaningful trade threats that China poses to the United States. The espionage referenced earlier is dominance of rare earth metals. Critical infrastructure in the United States, from hospitals to the military, the government and industry, that is reliant upon products that are shipped from China. And then finally, there are the copyright violations that we really have to crack down on to protect the inventors of new discoveries, of music, of art, and other profitable materials. It is now time to turn our attention to U.S. foreign policy options. What are we to do with China in our trade relationship? The first question that we will ask was posed earlier. Will China surpass the United States in overall economic volume? The answer to that is undoubtedly yes. All of the trend lines indicate that by mid-century, China will be significantly larger than the United States in terms of economic output. But does that really matter, particularly given that much of this data is based upon the old way of calculating it, where China is given full credit, even though the products it ships to us are not really manufactured fully in the People's Republic. It's the second question that really matters. Will China succeed the United States as the leading power, the hegemon of the 21st century? The answer to that is no. China is never going to become the world leader. The United States has so many advantages over China. For example, we look at the three main indicators of power for a country. Their geostrategic location in the world, which means where they are relative to other great powers. The richness of their soil, the depth and width of their rivers. Are they navigable? Do they connect major industrial and population centers? And what natural resources lie in the ground? And then finally, we consider the population trend line, the demographics. Is it growing healthily or is there a real problem 
with either overgrowth or decline. We begin with Russia. Russia fares very poorly on most of these measures. Its geographic richness, well, it's there, the resources, the oil, the gold, the silver, the fresh water, the clean air, it can all be found in Russia in large volume, but it's very difficult to get at given the lack of infrastructure development. And Russia's demographic trend line is clearly negative. The country is shrinking. How about China? Is it going to surpass the U.S. based upon these three indicators? Not very impressive. From geographic location to the richness of the soil to the population, really doesn't fare much better than does Russia. And the United States, we're all A's across the board. We have an ideal geostrategic location, insulated by two large oceans and the Gulf of Mexico, with non-threatening powers to the north and south. Our soil is the richest in the world, and our population is growing at a nice, steady clip. We can use these three measures of long-term power to chart the path moving forward. Russia's in the most precarious position. Its 21st century future is incredibly dim. China comes next. We have the expectation of continued growth, perhaps reaching the U.S. in overall impact, but then a very steady decline thereafter. And for the United States, we will sort things out domestically. Things will get better, and by the time we reach mid-century, the U.S. will separate once again from all other contenders to the throne of hegemonic position. China's future, I do not believe, is particularly bright. It has lost the most important race that any country engages in. It did not get rich before it started to get old. Its demographics are all negative. China is getting smaller each and every day. Projections are for a large decrease in the number of Chinese. The lending partners abroad are growing tired of China. They took on all of that debt to invest in infrastructure. They accepted the rosy projections of economic growth as a result. They allowed the Chinese technical officers to enter the country and direct those projects. But they're growing weary of it. They're beginning to realize that that technology and that infrastructure just isn't paying off like they had hoped, and they're getting a bit tired of the Chinese directing their projects. And the leadership of China is particularly unimpressive. I've always been astounded that people hold Xi up as a brilliant and great leader of China. His track record really isn't that impressive. Most recently, he has stumbled badly on COVID policy his engagement with the West, and even efforts to disengage his economy have not gone smoothly, and much of his domestic policies have been unimpressive. Compare that with the United States. We didn't lose that important race. We got wealthy before we began to age, and our demographic trend line is quite positive. We don't have borrower's remorse in the world, certainly not to the level that China is experiencing. Our leadership, well, I'll leave that up to you to debate in your small circles. If it's not impressive, there's always hope that our democratic system will lead to better leadership as the years unfold. U.S. trade policy options, we can divide them along the lines of our main theories of foreign policy. Liberals believe that trading with China will change the country internally. This has been one of our hopes and beliefs since the 1970s. It increased in intensity once China joined the World Trade Organization. There is, however, no evidence that China is going to change internally. There's no indication that it will become a more open and free society or even a more inventive one. The political realists argue we need to punish China to bring it into compliance with American trade policy. Bill Clinton did this with the Japanese in the 1990s and was very successful. But China today is not Japan of the 1990s. It continues to be on the rise as opposed to decline, and it is disengaging its supply chain from the United States. Punishment may or may not work. 
What we do know for certain is that a trade war with China will lead to enormous losses on both sides of the Pacific. And finally, the America First argument is we need to fully separate our supply chain from China, rely upon other markets, trade in other markets, and embrace a trade war with China to show it that the U.S. is the more capable economy and will ultimately win that trade battle. The choices, of course, are up to us. Until next time, stay engaged and make great decisions. Well, that was quite an overview that we were given. I don't know about Dr. Paul, but I heard a little bit of uh, U.S. bias and assumptions that um, about our inevitable greatness. But at any rate, let me turn to our expert now. I'm joined by uh, Dr. Sanjay Paul, who is an uh, economics professor at Elizabethtown College, where he has been since 2002. He has taught courses in microeconomics, macroeconomics, mathematical economics, international economics, I could go on and on with the economics. And, and he is also part of the international organization seminar course uh, that, and he leads a study tour to Geneva. And he's also led study tours uh, throughout the globe, Brussels, Dhaka, the United Nations, New York. Um, I am going to tell you that he does have a PhD in economics. Uh, from the State University of New York, Buffalo, and a Bachelor's of Technology in Civil Engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology in Madras. And I will tell you, I have significantly and probably criminally abbreviated his extensive bio. But it will, uh, suffice it to say, he is an expert in this, but he is able to take these complex issues and make them possible for people like me to understand. So with that, Dr. Paul, let me turn it over to you for your analysis of what we have just heard. Uh, thank you, Joyce. Uh for those very uh, warm words of introduction. Um, uh, 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 thank you for inviting me to uh, be part of this great event, uh, which I think is uh, uh, quite necessary, <laughs> uh, uh, especially in today's world, uh, because you give an opportunity to look at different issues from different perspectives and get people to think about these questions. Uh, if I may share uh, my PowerPoint, I have a brief uh, uh, PowerPoint to to start off the discussion. So I'll give yes, that a Yes, I think short... Michelle will be able to share the PowerPoint oh, with us. Or let, I, probably working on that. Uh, let me see if that works. There you go. Okay. Good. So, um, so I'll talk about four things briefly. First some key points from the video that we just saw. Uh, and, and then uh, I, I want to bring in some data to uh, inform our thinking about the progress that China has made in recent years, which was also mentioned in the video. Uh, we'll take a look at the trade issue, uh, China's trade, and in particular, China-US trade, and, and then uh, conclude with a brief discussion of challenges. So the key points from the video, uh, uh, this is not an exhaustive list, uh, but, but some of them, uh, the China has grown rapidly over the last three decades, uh, that the US dominance is under threat uh, uh, regionally, perhaps also globally. Uh, US-China relations are fraught. Uh, and, and then uh, uh, the video discusses prospects for cooperation and uh, perhaps confrontation in the years ahead. So if we look at uh, uh, China's progress over the last three decades, uh, and, and we start with a, with a look at the poverty rate, uh, we do find an astonishing uh, decline in the poverty rate since 1990, when the poverty rate was about 72%, and, and it has now fallen to practically zero. This is a remarkable uh, achievement. Uh, you see a similar uh, uh, achievement in the area of health. If you look at life expectancy in China, 
that has also risen quite sharply uh, over the last uh, 30 years from uh, 68 to um, 78 uh, at the moment. Literacy, so in the area of education, uh, the literacy rate was already quite high to begin with in 1990 uh, at about 94%. Uh, as, and now it's uh, using the World Bank's definition, uh, there is 100% literacy in, in China. All this data, by the way, uh, is from the World Bank. If you look at inequality, uh, the income distribution in society, the gap between the rich and the poor, well, uh, that was fairly high uh, and, and rose since the 1990s. Uh, but then starting around 2010, we see a marked decline in the Gini coefficient, which, which is essentially uh, an indication of falling inequality. And, and so uh, over the last 10 years, China has experienced a decline in income inequality as well. Um, so let's take a look at China's economy. Uh, and, and here I want to point out a couple of statements that were made in the video, which perhaps are somewhat questionable. So in the, in the slide where the speaker talks about uh, China by the economic numbers, uh, uh, he makes two assertions. One, that China is tied with the United States as the world's largest economy by volume. And second, it is the fastest growing econ fastest growing large economy in the international system. And I just want to take a look at both of these statements by uh, looking at the numbers. So if you look at uh, GDP, gross domestic product uh, for China and the United States, the, the blue line uh, on the graph is the US, China is the red line. And, and, and you see that US GDP, uh, which is around $25 trillion, this was in 2022, uh, was still greater than Chinese GDP of about $18 trillion. Uh, so uh, uh, as of the last available data from the World Bank, the US was still number one and, and China number two. And if you look at the largest economies in the world, the six largest are the United States followed by China. Uh, you can see the US GDP in the, in the third column, $25 trillion. China at about 18 trillion, followed by Japan, 4.3, Germany, 4.1. And then India is number five at 3.4, followed by the UK. And, and I want you to sort of uh, keep an eye on India because one of the assertions made uh, in the video was that China is the fastest growing large economy in the in the world. Well, let's take a look at the numbers. So here is a table showing GDP growth, the growth of the economy. Uh, this is from the IMF. Uh, the latest update is from January of 2024. And so you have the uh, uh, growth rate in 2022 uh, the estimate for the growth rate in 2023, and then projections for the next two years. And uh, if you look at China, the growth rate in 2022 was 3%, uh, but India grew at 7.2%. So clearly not the fastest growing large uh, economy in the world. And the same thing with 2023, India is uh, expected to grow at 6.7%. China 5.2, and the same uh, sort of trend continues for the next two years in 24 and 25, where India is expected to grow at a faster clip than is uh, China. So now if we turn to uh, trade, um, and uh, here we can take a look at exports uh, that uh, uh, China uh, has and uh, the United States has. Again, the blue line is the US, the red line is China. And, and you notice that uh, the, the, the Chinese uh, exports have uh, now risen above the US level of exports. Uh, China's exports currently are at about $3.7 trillion. That is uh, 
uh, one followed by 12 zeros. So $3.7 trillion is Chinese exports of goods and services. Uh, the US is number two at uh, 3 trillion. So the US, China has definitely exceeded uh, US exports uh, although the U.S. is no laggard at $3 trillion, we export a very significant amount of goods and services to the rest of the world. If you take a look at imports, since we are discussing trade here, we should look at both sides of trade. Uh, uh, you see that uh, the, well, the blue line against, again, the United States uh, is consistently above the uh, imports of China, the red line. Uh, and currently, uh, U.S., import stands at about 4 trillion. This is how much we buy in goods and services from the rest of the world in a year. And, and, and China is no slouch either when it comes to imports. Uh, for them, it's $3.1 trillion. So this graph shows the you know, extent of involvement in the global economy by the United States and, and also by China. Now, if you look at uh, trade between China and the United States. Uh, here we have uh, the blue line, which is uh, the imports by the United States from China. And so those, uh, uh, the imports by the United States, the blue line have consistently been greater uh, than the exports from the United States to China which is shown by the red line. And so if you look at the most recent data, what we have is we bought, the United States bought uh, about $500 uh, billion of goods and services in one year. This is for 2023. Uh, and, and China bought about $164 billion uh, of goods and services from the United States. Uh, this data, by the way, is from the China Customs Office, uh, and, and perhaps I will leave this as an assignment uh, to my students uh, in, in, in International Econ uh, uh, to see if this data is different or is it consistent with uh, trade data that is available from the U.S. Uh, census. But in any case, this I, I think the, uh, uh, the numbers may be somewhat different, but the overall picture is fairly going to be consistent. That is our imports from China vastly exceed our exports to China in goods and services. And, and you will notice uh, on this graph that uh, uh, around 2018, you will see a decline in US imports from China, the blue line. Uh, in 2018, we imported uh, $478 billion, uh, but it fell uh, to $419 uh, by 2019. Uh, and, and you see a similar decline also for our exports to China. It was about $155 billion in 2018, and uh, the next year it was down to $123. And uh, this is quite possibly, quite likely, the effect of the uh, protectionist policies that were adopted by the Trump administration. Uh, Trump had imposed tariffs uh, in a sort of a series of uh, escalation, uh, escalations where he imposed tariffs on China and then China would retaliate against US goods and, and then the United States would ratchet it up uh, to another level and then China would retaliate again. And so there was this tit for tat going on for a while. And, and uh, at the end of it all, what we saw was a decline in uh, imports from China uh, and also exports uh, to China. Uh, since uh, 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 the Biden administration has come to power, we have seen a, a reversal in that trend. Both our exports to China have increased. Uh, uh, and 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 uh, so have uh, imports from China. So a little bit about this rivalry, uh, and and uh, as Joyce mentioned, you know this rivalry is not just directly in trade, but there are other issues that are sort of uh, uh, you know in 
perhaps indirectly or some sometimes directly but also indirectly relevant to the to the trade issue uh but here is one uh aspect of uh, this sort of competition between the United States and China that may appear to favor China. And, and, and this was not quite mentioned in the video, but if you look at patent applications uh, uh, filed in the United States and in China, again, the red line is China, and, and you see the dramatic increase uh, over the last 10, 15 years. And, 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 and so uh, today, the number of patents filed in China, 1.4 million, you know, vastly exceeds the number of patents filed in the United States at one at 0 0.3 million, about 300,000 or so. And now, this may not be, uh, you know, a very clear uh, cut indicator of innovation, um, but it is an but it is an indication that China is investing in R and D. And, and it is starting to show up in the patent uh, data. If you look at uh, the military aspects, uh, which again, uh, indirectly will affect trade, uh, if there is any kind of uh, uh, a problem in the South China Sea or with, uh, you know, with Taiwan. Uh, if you look at the military spending, the United States is, is significantly above China in this regard. Uh, the U.S. Uh, spends about 3.5% of its uh, GDP on the military. Uh, China uh, is at 1.6%. And, and finally, uh, if there was one issue where China might uh, have some problems in the in the in the years ahead. It might have to do with their population growth, and so for a long time, uh, the thinking in 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 China was that uh, the population was growing too fast. It had to be curbed, and so they had the one-child policy for for several years in place. Um, but then uh, they uh, realized that this actually was turning into a problem. Uh, that they were not producing enough uh, enough babies, and and so they switched to the two child policy uh, around 2015, uh, hoping to spur families uh, to to have more children, uh, and uh, even that was not successful, and so now they have uh, the three child policy, so two plus, uh, and they are trying their best to encourage families to have more children. Uh, and if you look at the population data, you see that the Chinese population has peaked, uh, you know, around 20, uh, 2021. And, and then you see it's starting to decline. This is the UN projections for population. You see that China is expected to see a shrinking population over the next, uh, you know, 25 years or so, while the United States uh, uh, you know, not quite the spring chicken here, but uh, the U.S. population is still expected to increase gradually over the next 25 years or so. And, and these are significant implications for, uh, you know, social security uh, systems, for uh, social insurance for the elderly. Uh, all that depends crucially on population growth. And so this is where the United States might have an edge. And, 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 and a lot of it is due to uh, immigration. So the United States population is increasing in part due to uh, the number of people who choose to migrate to the United States. And they tend to be uh, relatively younger as well. So that contributes to a growing tax base and various attendant benefits that come out of it. So perhaps at this point, uh, Joyce, uh, I might uh, stop and and turn it over to you and the audience for Q and A. Well, yeah, let let's talk because you've raised some some really interesting things. And I mean, I don't know where to jump in, but I'll just jump in with my first um, provocative question because that that statement from Xi about being prepared for war with the United States by twenty twenty seven, I think we need to dwell on that for a little bit. 
what are your thoughts on that? I mean, we're, we're already in 2024, right? That means in three years, we'd be facing a catastrophe for the world. Was he serious? Was he, I mean, what do you think? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, th th this is, this is uh, uh, slightly beyond my realm of uh, expertise. Uh, it, it's really hard to divine, uh, you know, what the future holds. Okay. So, but, uh, uh, but I think you are quite right in in that uh, a war would be would be catastrophic. Uh, uh, the the Taiwan issue, uh, you know, is a crucial issue, and uh, so far we have managed to avoid, um, you know, coming to blows over it. Uh, but. Uh, China has taken aggressive steps in the region, in the South China Sea, to develop um, uh, islands, to militarize the islands. Uh, it has made, as you said, she has made uh, sort of, uh, you know, said the unthinkable. These are really things that leaders should not be talking about. Uh, but, but, uh, 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 but if it were to happen, this this could this could be devastating, um, and 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 uh, uh, there are uh, uh, other disputes going on as well. I, I, I for for what it is worth, you know, I am not entirely sure that we will we will end up in a in a real kind of military confrontation. But what who knows? Well, in many ways, I guess she was signaling that perhaps the choice would be the U.S. I mean, it would be our choice whether we would step forward and engage in a war to to protect Taiwan. Um, and from what we're seeing with Ukraine, <laughs> maybe we wouldn't interfere. I mean, who knows? But that was just the first thing that 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 jumped out at me. And and in this, indeed, you pointed out that they really aren't investing uh, that much, at least not more than us, in military uh, spending. So that would give one the impression that they're not really, or has that has their military spending increased over the past decade? Do you know that? Uh, it, it has not really increased substantially as a percentage of GDP. Now, their GDP has grown. So uh, uh -huh. uh, uh, even if the percentage is somewhat low, I mean, they're still spending, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars per year on, on the military, on defense. Uh, mm -hmm. But the U.S. is spending even more. Uh, the U.S. GDP has also risen over time. And and so at three point five percent of GDP, we are, you know, we are spending uh, uh, very close to a trillion dollars uh, 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 on on defense per year. So, uh, I mean, the United States is the spending on military is greater, exceeds the combined spending of military spending by the next, uh, you know, five six countries uh, at least. <laughs> And that right. includes China, so that that it's not likely that is going to reverse anytime soon. Uh, there is, uh, it's really hard to see, given the uh, instability in the world today, that the United States is going to cut back sharply on on military spending. The last time that happened was was really during the 1990s when there was a kind of you know Pax Americana where uh, 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 there was uh, a significant drop. In military spending as a percentage of GDP, but but at the moment it doesn't look like uh, we are anywhere close to that era, and so the U.S. will continue to spend sharply more than all of you know most of the major countries in the world, right? Put right. together. And I will I will say that one thing you pointed out that also struck me is is. Um, the positive side of China's growth, the fact that there are fewer poor people, that there are fewer unemployed people, and that the, and even in the late, the income inequality, the, you know, bridging that divide between poor and rich. How is, it, it, as we're looking at that, those are really positive things. How is the American economy compared with that? Have we done better in taking care of everyone as China seems to have done? Uh, not entirely. And uh, uh, now there are there are a lot of positive things about the U.S. economy, uh, and you know if you look at the unemployment rate, for instance, uh, uh, it 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 has been under four percent for several months now. Uh, 
Um, uh, and 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 even before that, if you look at the 1990s, uh, for a large part of the uh, 2000s until the global financial crisis, and then uh, after the crisis, it took a while for the U.S. to recover uh, from that uh, uh, from the negative effects of the uh, global financial crisis. But unemployment had come down even very sharply, uh, you know, by the time uh, uh, COVID hit. And, and then, uh, of course, uh, COVID uh, uh, upset the apple cart. Uh, but but now we are down to under 4% for several months in a row, which quite frankly, you know, would have seemed startling to anyone who was looking at uh, the economic projections, say, three years ago. Uh, there were quite a few economists who were saying unemployment would have to be uh, well over uh, seven, eight, maybe even in the double digits. Uh, you know, for inflation to be wrung out. So so I think the U.S. has done fairly well in terms of unemployment, in terms of uh, creating jobs, which have been, which has been quite uh, quite a robust development in the United States. Right. Uh, so we have two strong economies that, that seem to be maintaining that even in the post-COVID era. I, I think that is correct. Uh, mm -hmm. The United States has done exceptionally well you know, when compared to uh, the other large economies in the world, if you look at the Western European countries, uh, uh, the U.S. has done uh, uh, very well on growth of the economy, on keeping unemployment low, and even in inflation, on on the on the matter of inflation, where uh, we have had uh, fairly high inflation in two, 2022, but since then it has fallen fairly sharply. Um, and 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 better than the record of many European countries as well. Yeah, we we could get into later why Americans say they don't feel like it's a good economy. That's another thing. Maybe we just like to complain. <laughs> but <laughs> let, let me let me take the question from Jackie. She does ask because um, we're trying to do this comparison. Does China have a social security system and unemployment payments similar to the U.S.? Is that are they taking care of their people from cradle to grave, or how does this go? Uh, not quite. Uh, 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 again, I, I, I don't have very specific knowledge of their social insurance system, but I, I, I think they still rely fairly heavily on families taking care of their of the elderly, and, and so uh, uh, it is. If you look at the savings that Chinese households do, they save a lot, and 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 the and one reason for saving a lot is uh, uh, so that in old age, they are able to sort of, uh, you know, have the resources to either take care of themselves. But with the one-child policy, that means uh, that you don't have many children now to take care of their parents when they are elderly. So essentially, the elderly- have more money, but you should have yeah. more money. <laughs> right. they, they have more money and, and that's their savings. So they are saving a lot in part to to pay for retirement, to pay for healthcare, and so on in their old age. In the United States, of course, we have Social Security, we have Medicare, and those things have uh, have uh, meant that we don't need to save as much when we are younger to enjoy fairly good standards of living when we are retired because of the social insurance programs. Mm -hmm. You know, I find it it interesting that. China is still considered a communist country and communist countries are supposed to right guarantee a certain stability, a stable income at, for everybody. Uh, I look at the socialist systems in, in Europe and even in, if you're an unemployed young person, you're getting some sort of payment from the government. I'm just surprised that China does not have that attitude that you will always be taken care of by the government, you know. I, I, I suspect, uh, uh, and, 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 and I think you're quite right about, you know, Western Europe, if you look at their social insurance systems, uh, retirement, unemployment benefits, uh, I think they tend to be more generous than uh, the U.S. system of social insurance, uh, uh, especially in the uh, Nordic countries, uh, some of which have a sort of cradle to grave, grave approach uh, for education, for health, and so on. Uh, so you do see uh you know a greater reliance on on the government on the uh, public sector for uh social insurance for health insurance and education uh 
and, and 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 quite possibly as countries like china become richer you know they they they, they would also transition into that kind of system uh, but it has not happened yet uh, to the same degree Okay, let me take some questions also. Someone is asking, was consenting to the ascension of China into the WTO a strategic mistake based on an assumption that China would change to adapt to a liberal economic order as it became a stakeholder in that order? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, so it was in 2001 that China joined the World Trade Organization and uh, when you join the World Trade Organization, you get certain benefits. Uh, there are over 160 countries in the WTO. So now these countries cannot uh, impose tariffs on uh, you know, China's goods coming into their country, willy-nilly. I mean, there are some exceptions, but by and large, when you join the WTO, this is true for any member. They, mm -hmm. they enjoy uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the benefits of relatively free trade in most of the goods that they export and import. Uh, and, and so China benefited from that. China also benefited from foreign investment coming into China because multinational corporations now felt there was this sort of added uh, security you know, of being part of WTO. The risk was a bit lower and therefore they were willing to invest even more in China uh, when China became a member of the WTO because it meant that China would have to follow WTO rules when it came to trade, and they could not, uh, you know, willy-nilly uh, 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 punish foreign corporations or take action against foreign corporations. Well, uh, part of the problem then was uh, uh, that uh, in the United States, uh, a certain number of jobs, especially in manufacturing, uh, uh, were lost. Now, now, there is still a healthy debate about, uh, you, you know, what exactly caused the loss of manufacturing jobs in the United States over the last couple of decades. Uh, part of it might be uh, China uh, uh, taking away some of those jobs as foreign corporations, uh, multinational corporations went to China and opened factories there, employing uh, you know, relatively lower cost Chinese labor. Um, but there's also an argument that uh, uh, the loss in manufacturing jobs was was really a continuation of a long-term trend. If you look at manufacturing in the United States over the long term, over a period of several decades, you see that uh, the United States is, uh, the number of people employed in manufacturing has declined sharply over the decades. Uh, that's being absorbed in services by and large. Um, but but this is true for almost all countries. Even in China, you will notice that if you look at manufacturing as a percentage of GDP, that has been declining in China over the last few years. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, but in any, in any uh, case, there is a little bit of, uh, uh, it is quite possible that uh, the, the China's entry into the WTO might have led to some manufacturing jobs being lost in the United States, and 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 then uh, that has led to resentment against uh, uh, free trade policies that might have led to uh, contributed to the rise of President Trump, who was able to exploit some of these resentments. Uh, and 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 so the I think the jury is still out on on whether letting China into WTO was entirely a good thing or a bad thing, but but there are now problems in the World Trade Organization that uh, are linked to China but are also linked to the United States. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So the jury is still out on that one. Sorry for, for not being a decisive answer there. There's a lot of factors at play here. We also have a question saying, given the projection of India's population to have slightly surpassed China's recently, what do you anticipate India's economic growth rate is going to be in the next decade or two? Uh, so we, 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 we had a slide on the uh, growth projections from the International Monetary Fund uh, for 2020, 
2023, 2020, 2024, and 2025. And in all those projections, India is expected to grow fairly rapidly, uh, around five, six, seven percent per year, but starting to slow down uh, uh, towards the end of that period. Um, so uh, 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 there, there are some signs that the Indian economy is, well, uh, GDP growth is fairly robust at the moment. Uh, uh, in, and in fact, the uh, latest data uh, uh, was revised upwards, uh, show a revision upwards. So that was a pleasant surprise. Uh, just like in the U.S., by the way, <laughs> uh, in the U.S. too, uh, the actual growth rate of the economy has consistently been higher than had been expected. And, and I think you see the same thing in India. Whether this will continue or not, uh, it, it's it's really a hard question if they can, if India can maintain, uh, you know, a sort of sizzling growth rate of, you know, 6% year after year after year. But given its rising population, uh, uh, which can be both good and bad in a way, uh, you, 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 you will have uh, uh, a, a rise in the younger, uh, at the younger end of the uh, population pyramid, uh, and that can help with social insurance and so on. Uh, but at the same time, there is also the problem of youth unemployment in India, which is quite severe. And so unless that is that problem is tackled, simply having a larger population is not going to yield the dividends that it otherwise, otherwise might. Well, at least China is not saddled with a large youth population that is unemployed, right? I mean, that's, that's at least a good thing in its favor. I wanted to ask you too, who is China's um, main largest trading partner? Uh, so I, I think as a country, it, 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 it would be the United States. Okay. So you, you have the two largest countries, and I, I, and I, I think I'm right on this. I, I, uh, uh, it, it, it's very likely the United States. But if you look at regions, you might have a difference. So for example, uh, China trade with the European Union or with ASEAN, um, right. the members of ASEAN, you know, there you might have uh, uh, that amount of trade exceeding uh, trade between the U.S. and China. But I think if you just look at individual countries, uh, I, I think the trade between the U.S. and China is so large. We looked at the export numbers, the import numbers. Uh, I, 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 it, that, that has to be the largest in the world. Okay, I guess I wouldn't. And finally, I guess the, the one last thing I'd like, which is this big picture view that clearly the gentleman is patriotic and we're all patriotic Americans. We think we're the best thing since sliced bread. But as we're looking at predictions and all of this, I mean, he clearly minimized the potential problems in the United States that basically we shall overcome them <laughs> we will be f and did not do the same did not have that same optimism for china now there could be valid reasons for that we do have a democracy at least for now uh there is in china the the idea that it is not as open it is not as encouraging of free thinking and free thought which is is a prerequisite for innovation i think um so i guess the final answer a question i'm that i'm wondering is was he right in looking at this this duel here and saying there's so much more going for the United States and, and much more optimism it'll resolve the problems internally and externally and less optimistic that China has the resources, the brain power or whatever to do so. Is that is that the right analysis of this? Yeah, it might be. Uh, uh, but as you said, uh, the speaker in the video was... Uh... Uh, perhaps overly optimistic about the U.S. Uh, uh, domestic situation. Uh, and uh, if you had asked this question before 2016, I think the answer would have been yes. The United States has significant strengths, including a vibrant democracy and all the uh, attendant uh, advantages that come from it. But uh, uh, as we have seen over the last few years, that uh, we cannot take those things for granted, even in the United States. Uh, and uh, so the uh, the great advantage that the United States possessed, which was uh, 
you know, the values that it sort of expounded on, that it propounded in international forums, countries would listen, uh, perhaps even follow a U.S. Uh, guidance on on some of these issues. Uh, you know, I think that that has uh, that has been diminished over the last few years. Now, uh, 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 despite all this, the U United States still has some very uh, uh, strong advantages, although the uh, policy, the one policy that uh, Trump has mentioned he would like to institute if he came back to power uh, is very disturbing. Uh, he has said he would like to impose massive tariffs again on goods coming from China. And, 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 and this is going to invite immediate retaliation by China. And, uh, and, and so this could lead to a, a kind of tit for tat once again, but this time with perhaps even more, uh, that is even more fraught with peril uh, and, and could harken, harken back to uh, you know, the Great Depression. One of the causes for the Great Depression, or at least made the depression worse, was this institution of a tit for tat trade policy by the United States and Europe. Mm. And uh, and that made the Great Depression even worse, and and so if 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 we are if you are willing to learn the lessons from history, uh, and 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 actually we have learned the lessons from history, uh, 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 you know quite well in some cases, uh, then we would not be thinking of imposing, you know, massive tariffs on goods from China, as as uh, as has been sort of suggested. In the case of China, on the other hand. Uh, as you pointed out, if you don't have a democratic system, uh, it's really, and if you don't have an open society, uh, you know, an exchange, a real exchange of ideas and so on is going to be, uh, is going to be difficult. Uh, and innovation might be, uh, uh, might be diminished as a result. Uh, now, so far, China has managed to overcome these obstacles. Whether they can continue to do so over decades, you know, that's entirely another question, I think. Right. And just one f final thing, we did have someone type in, how far can the friendshoring effort to nearby countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, and India go? Do you anticipate a capacity limit to what those countries may be able to take at the expense of trade with China? So that's our final question. Do you anticipate a capacity limit on this? Well, not not in the near future. China is such the, the China's GDP at about eighteen trillion dollars. You know, dwarfs uh, every other economy in the region, with the exception of Japan, which itself is below five trillion dollars uh, or, or, or thereabouts. So, uh, 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 so it, it's going to take an, a a very long time before any other country comes close to Chinese economic might in 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 the in the region. Um, and and these countries uh, in the region rely very heavily on on the Chinese market to absorb some of the production, to absorb some of the goods that they produce and they export to China. So any kind of conflict, and this goes back to your initial question, Joyce, about war, any kind of conflict is not going to be confined. It's going to have vast ramifications for all the countries, not not only in the region, but actually around the world. And, you know, I find it surprising that a country like China that um, is has rapidly become a world power again, it once was, but again, would even consider something that would risk the the disaster that it would certainly bring to 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 the Chinese people, not a, let alone to the rest of the world and the U.S., but it would certainly hurt its own efforts that it that is achieved. So with that, maybe that's the most optimistic note we can leave on. Maybe they're too smart to risk what they've achieved by war over an, over a tiny place like Taiwan. We is that possible? So. It, it, I, I certainly hope you're right, Joyce. Yes.
Yeah. Well, on that happy note, we want to say <laughs> thank you to Dr. Sanjay Paul for taking time out of what is clearly a busy schedule to be with us. We will certainly be inviting him again to share his thoughts. As you can see, he he's quite an expert in these issues, which are very complex for the rest of us. But with that, I also thank the audience who tunes in as well as the ones with us in the webinar and the ones online via Facebook. So please enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks again, Dr. Sanjay Paul. Thank Goodbye. you.